Welcome back. Today we're going to learn how to manipulate every single pixel on the canvas and at the same time have this amazing gravitational effect around your mouse. And as you can see, I could hover around the image, grab everything, put it into a little giant ball, and when I remove my mouse, everything goes back to the way it was. And we're going to make it so that we could select an image that we want to use. See? No cat. A cat. Alright, let's begin. To begin, we're going to have our browser open in incognito mode. Not sure if it's required or not, but we're just going to keep it that way. In our project folder, create a new file, an empty text file. Call it index.html, remove the .txt, and this will change our text file into a HTML file. Drag that file into both your IDE and your browser. I'm going to turn off the previous web page. It's, it's quite computationally expensive because we're simulating every single pixel, so we're going to close it for now. To begin, you'll have your empty web page. Press F12 to get the debugger, see our elements, and you fill in, in with our stuff. Start with doc type. HTML head script for our JavaScript install. Then we have our body tag. As usual, we'll have a container for our canvas. Canvas will give it an ID. And same for the container. We said we were going to have an input for our image as well. So first, the container input type file. And we need to give this an ID. Image file input. Try to stay consistent. Next, we'll need to define a button for that input. So, idea of the button would be. ID image file input button. And we're just going to call this load. For the container, we'll give it another an ID as well. ID image file input dive. Save and refresh, and we'll see our HTML. There's the input here, and if we hover across the different elements, you can see that our canvas is there. We're going to give our canvas a little border so we can see it and visualize it. So if we type live border one pixel red. 
install it. You can see able to see all the divisions or the containers. And for our canvas, we're gonna make it blue. Refresh. As you can see, we have one container for our canvas and one container for our input. We're going to place the input to one of the edges here. So, how do we do that? We just type hashtag to designate an ID, image. I'll input live and we're going to save the position. We're going to place it fixed to the screen. And then it will be zero pixels above from the bottom of the page. If we refresh, you see that our, our input dive is placed down here. Next, you see this white border. We'll remove it. Body margin zero. Padding zero. And we want the body to be a hundred percent of the viewpoint. Percent. And as we said before, the height you'll need to put in the actual value. You can't use percentages, so we'll just type viewpoint. Height. Refresh. Everything is gone and our containers are touching the edges now. Next, we're going to define the size of our canvas container. Hashtag to identify the container. With 100% height, 100% refresh, and our canvas container is filling the entire page. But because of that one pixel border, we have this ugly scroll bar here. We can remove the scroll bar by typing overflow. hidden, but if you don't want to type that, you just remove the one pixel border and it should be okay, I believe. See, the scroll bars are gone because our viewpoint division is occupying 100% of the body and it is not stretched beyond the size of the window. But sometimes it's good to have overflow hidden here, just to be certain. I want the background of my container to be black for my image. Background color black. If I refresh this, my my page is black, but the problem is my input is black as well, so I don't see the file that I'm putting in. We're going to change that background color to white. Refresh, and everything looks okay. 
So this is pretty much it for our HTML. We have our container with our canvas, our input for our file. We've changed how it looks using CSS here. Now we're going to focus on the code, which is the JavaScript. First, we're going to define a function to resize our canvas. In that function, we're going to grab our canvas. Which is bare canvas rules document dot get element by ID and your canvas ID. But we're not going to define it here, we're going to have a global variable that encase our string ID. On here. Scroll down to the bottom, copy this ID, ID viewpoint, and place it here. We're going to go ahead and make another one for our input as well. And our input button. So all of the elements on our HTML will keep track of their ID in the global variable. The reason why I'm copying the IDs instead of typing it out is because this would reduce the frequency of errors. You should do this when you're programming on your own too. Next, all I have to do is type dglobal dot canvas ID. If no not equals to double canvas double canvas dot with will equal to w canvas dot parent node dot offset with same thing for the height We're going to call this function using our init function. Init. Go down a bit. And here we'll call our resize function. We would also want to add an event listener that would resize our page whenever we actually resize our page. Then we need to call this initialization function when the page loads. So on the main window, we're going to add an event listener there. And load call the init function. Uh, 
if we reside, uh, refresh, you see that our canvas is occupying the entire page now. The blue border is our canvas. We no longer need this border. We'll erase it. And this is our main boilerplate. So HTML, CSS, JavaScript. With this, we're going to begin cutting our image. First, what we're going to do is we're going to listen to when the image file input button is clicked. Copy this. In our initialization function, type a button close to the document dot get element by ID. The argument will be G global dot file input ID dot input button ID. If no not equals to w button like a button dot add event listener and the event for button click is simply click then we're going to add a function to load our our image and here we're going to type var dot image I'll input and it will equal to get document dot get element by ID global dot file input ID if this is not null, we're going to grab the file from this element and put it into a data URL and input it into our image. So our files. So input dot files and we did the first one. So what this says is checks if the files array is there and if it does exist, check if this first element is available. Then we need to have an image to accept this file. So first data URL equals to URL dot create object URL and here we're going to put our first file now we need to make a global hidden image to load that image here we type Hit an image and to create one, create element img. This creates an image item but not appended to the HTML body, so you don't see it on the web page. Global dot hit an image dot source equals w data url now we have a hidden image we want to load it into our canvas how do we do that we're going to check 
when the image loads, we're going to draw it onto our canvas. So another event listener, but this time of a different flavor. The onload equals to function. And here we're going to get our canvas. For the moment, we're just we're just going to draw it directly onto our canvas. Not get element by ID global dot canvas ID. Scroll up a bit. If no, not equal to W canvas. And you CTX equals to W canvas. Get context two D. If null not equals to WCTX, the X dot draw image G global, and we can refer to our image directly. Hidden image. Zero, zero. If we refresh, there's an error. Remove this. And try loading an image. See, our image is drawn at zero, zero. Now that we have our image in our canvas, we want to have it preloaded so we don't have to load our file every single time. How do we do that? We're just going to go online and search for data URL. If we do so, you'll, you'll find a lot of data URL generators that would help you change your image into a data URL. Click on one of them, choose a file, choose an image you want as your default image. Here, let's say I would use our Among Us. Yeah, let's just spice it up with Harry Potter. And then here, you could just copy this data URL and have a location in your file to store it. Let's say Harry G Harry image. Put two quotation marks and paste that entire data URL in there. It's really long and it's going to spend our entire, well, it's going to take up a lot of space. Let's put it that way. And then in our init file, what we could do, let's stretch this out a bit. What we could do is in our hidden image uh, on load, we could, before that happens, we could say g global dot hidden image dot source equals to Harry. And if we go back to our web page and reload, you see that Harry is sitting there nice and proper. Close that. And now we want to modify this so that the image is drawn 
every single iteration. Because right now, whenever we reset the canvas, our image is gone. How do we do that? It's time for our game loop or animation loop, whatever you want to call it. Usually, we call it just game loop or iteration. Game loop. But in order to be able to call it, it needs to exist. Function. Game loop. And we're going to copy this code here when it activates on load to our game loop. Since we want this to happen only when the image is loaded, in our global variable here, we're going to type image is loaded. And we will set it to false first. And in our onload function, we're just going to type image is loaded equals to true. When image is loaded is equal to true, if true equals to g global dot hidden image uh, dot image is loaded then we will draw it on our canvas well technically there's not much we could do if the image is not loaded so We're just going to say if false equals equals images loaded, then we're going to return the function. In order to have this function called every single iteration, we're just going to do our favorite request animation function call. Game loop. And here we're going to paste our canvas function. Yeah. Let's see what do we get when we do that. Is there an error? I don't know what's wrong. Let's check. We're going to put a breakpoint in our game loop. Is it being called? It's not being called. The reason why it's not being called is because we miss the brackets here. Save. Let's do this. Our game loop is being called. Play. And I probably mistyped it. If you're not sure of a, about a function name, just type it in Google. So the proper the proper function call is request animation frame. All right, let's refresh and see. Harry Potter is drawn there, and when we resize the window, Harry Potter is still there. All right, what we're going to do next is we're going to center Harry Potter to the middle of the page. To do that, we're going to need a little bit of logic. This draw image here, other than taking the reference point as where do you want to draw the image, also takes a height and a width to let you define how wide and how high, how tall you want your image to be. For instance, if I set type 100 and 500, 
And you see I hit deformed Harry Potter. So we're going to make it so that we're going to scale it to the center of the page. Start with W scale width. And we're going to make this equal to the width of our hidden image over the width of our canvas. So hidden image over width of canvas, which is W canvas dot width. With this scale, we would have a multiplier to tell us how to scale our picture. And this would be multiplying our image width. And this would be our image height. I made it. And because you're multiplying the image width here, you should I should have probably reversed this. So I'm going to make it inverted. This would match Harry Potter to the width of our canvas. See? But that's not good. Harry Potter's face is not there anymore. We're going to add another line for the height. And we're going to select the one that is bigger. Or if you want to give it a try first. Refresh. Oh. I need to put it one over. Let's rename this to scale. See, now we're matching the height. We're going to make it so that we're going to select the one that fits our purpose. Sometimes the width is bigger, sometimes the height is bigger. So we're going to just make scale equal to the bigger one. And here I'm going to show you a fancy if statement. With height, and then choose scale with This should be a question mark. Scale height. If we refresh, you see that right now it's matching the height. If I make this smaller, probably not the best example out there. Let's choose a bigger picture. Something that's a little bit more square. Right now it's matching the height. If I stretch it like this, it's matching the width. 
So essentially our image would transform as we go. Let's explain this fancy if statement. What it does is, if scale is greater than height, question mark, then use the width, else use the height. It's an old syntax from C plus, oh, from C. It's a great way to condense if statement and I do not recommend you to use nested if statement like this way, but, but you can. It makes it a lot more complicated. This only shortens everything into one line and it's easy to do. Otherwise, I'll have to type the entire thing out like right here and it's not that fun or it doesn't look that pleasant. All right, now we have the right size for our image. We're going to place it so that it's in the middle of the image instead. This new canvas image width We're going to take it out into its own equation or its own statement. The reason why we want to do this is because we want to do some calculations with this statement. So what we need to do is we need to calculate the point in which we should put the X and Y so that this image is at the center of the page. So let's do that. What we need is calculate this point. How do we do that? We're going to just find the middle of the page and minus the half of the width of the image. To find the middle of the page, it would be the canvas width. Fifth dot width divide by two. And then we want to add and we want to subtract, I mean half of the image, which is half of the image width. Let's see if this works. Refresh. See, now Harry Potter is at the middle of the page. We're going to use the same thing for the y coordinate, which is the height. Take half of the height, minus half of the image height. And that would be our y. If you want, you can simplify this by taking the divide by 2 out. But we're just going to leave it simple for now. Refresh. Well, you don't see it because Harry Potter is taller than our entire image. I'm going to change it back to our cat image. And you're going to see the transformation. It's in the middle of the width and middle of the height. Okay. Now that we have our image drawn, we want to start manipulating it so that we can see the pixels move around. Now is where the fun part begins. We're, we're going to code some logic so that we can move the pixels around. First, we're going to make a hidden reference image, or a hidden canvas, and then from our hidden canvas, we're going to draw the pixels over to our viewpoint canvas. Let's do that. We can call it hidden canvas. We're going to initialize it the same way we did with our image. Document dot create element canvas.
we should probably move this lower so the load image is loaded is with our hidden image if you want you can put some spacing here they're cheap and they don't cost any well they don't cost anything so they're cheap but they make your code a lot clearer we need to resize this canvas so in our resize function we're going to resize it using the dimensions of our viewpoint this is canvas id so we're going to go there hidden canvas equals to document dot get um, by d g global dot hidden canvas we're going to move this into our if statement the reason why is because we want it to match the canvas height and width Now, we want to draw this image of the cat, or later on Harry Potter, into our hidden canvas instead. So, what we're going to do, we can simply replace canvas ID here with the ID of our hidden canvas. Or, not really the ID of our hidden canvas, but a reference to our hidden canvas directly well probably not that one should we here we're going to replace all canvas with hidden canvas or uh, yeah we should do it actually we replace w canvas here instead of using document get element by id we're not we're going to call it G global not hidden canvas. If we want to reuse this canvas naming, a good practice when you're coding is to scope things. We don't want this canvas variable to mix up with our future reference to a canvas variable. So we could just simply put two curly brackets to scope our canvas variable. And we take all this and put it here. And we can say drawing image on hidden canvas. What this essentially does is every variable that is inside this curly bracket here will be destroyed when we get out of it. So this W canvas will not be available afterwards. Right now, everything we have is going to be drawn on the hidden canvas instead of the actual canvas we're looking into. So if we refresh, our cat or Harry Potter is gone. Our Harry Potter and our cat are no longer there. So, we need to add code to copy it back over. So first, we're going to get our hidden image, or hidden canvas. Global, not hidden canvas. 
and we are going to get our canvas output. We're going to call this viewpoint to make it less confusing. Document dot get element by ID G global dot canvas ID for this one you can check for no if no viewpoint We're going to return. That means that if we don't find this global.canvas ID, then we just ex exit the function. All right. Now we need to get the pixel information of the canvas. So we're going to write there dot image hidden. Image. There dot hidden canvas TTX equals to we're just going to type hidden CTX get context CD. This is our usual. Put a null check. There, not hidden image data. Get the pixel information. We're going to type W hidden canvas dot get image data, and this you'll need to put the locate start location and the height and the width of the pixels you need. We want the entire thing, so it would be the W hidden canvas. Dot with the hidden canvas dot height, and for the pixel information, we're going to get w pixel w pixel data equals to W hidden image data data hidden pixel data. We're gonna do the same thing but with our viewpoint. Just take this, copy, paste, and place hidden canvas of viewpoint and we want to rename this otherwise it's going to overwrite our existing variables Alright, let's explain this one more time. It looks like a mess. Put some comments. Get hidden canvas. Get hidden canvas. 
context. In this line, we get hidden canvas image data. What this function does, it returns the pixel information of the area defined by 0, 0, of the width of canvas width, and the height of canvas height. And this function only makes it easier to get the data out, or reference the data. Get hidden canvas pixel data. We're just going to type the comments again, and we did the same thing for our viewpoint. This function gets the viewpoint, this function gets the viewpoint CTX context. This function gets the image data and this function references the pixel data in the image data. Pixel data. All right. Now we have our view pixel data and our we have right now we have our view pixel data and our hidden pixel data. These two parameters. We're just going to type them out. With these two variables, we want to copy the pixel data from here to here. But they're arrays. I can't just copy them directly. We're going to use a for loop. For wvar, oh, for var, wi equals to zero. wi less than w hidden pixel data dot length because it's a javascript array the length variable is available plus plus wi from here I'm going to take this Paste it here and make an array reference to copy per element of the pixels. Once you have that, you need to put this viewpoint pixel data back into the canvas. How do you do that? You just take the viewpoint context and type put image data. As you see, it's the image data itself and then the location you want to put it. So for us, it's the viewpoint image data right here and the location is 00. zero. Once we have that, refresh. There's a bug in our code. Let's start debugging. It's probably a syntax code because there's an error. So we click on console 
and click on this and it says it cannot set the width of undefined so it's in our resize function if we scroll up a little bit we see that it's in our resize function so what is undefined canvas is undefined wait let's see Oh, hidden canvas is undefined. It's because I did a mistake here. Hidden canvas is not an ID. It's an actual variable in our global function, our global variables. So it should be dglobal dot hidden canvas. And this should solve our issue. Unless we have another problem. Right now, we refresh, there's no more syntax errors, but there's probably a logic error somewhere. So let's check it out. For logic errors, click on source, put a breakpoint on your game loop. Let's make this more reasonable. See if it goes into our for loop, it does not. So what happened? It doesn't even go there. Okay. Go, go, go. Just jump through everything. And see where does the program go? Hidden image. See? Viewpoint is not defined, but we're not supposed to check the viewpoint. We're supposed to check the hidden canvas. My bad. All right. Go back here. Correct the error. Save. Let the code run. Refresh. You still don't see anything. Same thing again. You'll realize that coding involves a lot of debugging. Last time you left off was here. Go, go. Go until we hit something that does not work. That's our error. We're writing, we're letting viewpoint data equal to our hidden image data. We need to flip it over. Copy. Refresh. Go back there. Refresh. Finally, we see Potter Boy. Now, we're going to start modeling every single pixel. In order to do that, we need to have some dynamic information of every single pixel. So, we're not going to make objects everywhere. Okay, let's put some comments here. Global variable. Alright, so we'll call our subobject dynamic data. Curly brackets to create an object. What do we have? X position, a Y position, and a X and Y velocity. So we're just going to type pixel offset. X or 
it's already too long. I'll set X. We're gonna make this into null for now. I'll set Y. And then uh, dx for x velocity and a dy for y velocity. Afterwards, we're going to resize this to the size of our canvas. So we go to our resize function, which is, I don't know why it's drilled away, it's just underneath. We're going to say we're going to have an offset x and an offset y for every single pixel. So we need to calculate how many pixels do we have. So we're going to say pixel count. Equals to the width of the canvas times the height. Then then for each dynamic data here, just type it out. Not dynamic data or dynamic dot offset x. We're going to make a float array. This is different from our no normal array. Float arrays are using floats directly, which is just numbers, and our normal arrays accept objects. We need to type new float 32. Array. And we will need to define the size of the array. These are compact numbers, number arrays, and they're really efficient. And that's why using we can only use these to simulate the millions of pixels we have. We're going to repeat that for the y and the velocity. So dx and dy. Every time we resize the canvas, they're going to create a new set for them. Because our width and the height of our canvas is different. Now we need to initialize this array with zeros. So use our trusty for loop. For where wi equals to zero wi less than w pixel count plus plus wi and we're going to just take all this paste it here and place this bottom part last last part of the array with wi equals to 0, 0.0 copy this this essentially says element wi of an array equals to 0 Move these spaces AF to fix our code, to fix the format of our code. I probably just should have just selected those two, two lines. And our for loop is done.
we will need to reset this whenever we load a new image as well. So let's put it uh, type over here. in our onload and instead of pixel count so what this does is when our hidden image loads we're going to reset all this information here dot one as you know this is a javascript array so the length variable is available and we made it so that the size of these arrays are always the same when we initialize it. So we could use the same length variable here. All right. Now that we have our dynamic information initialized, we need to apply it to our pixels on our canvas. What we're going to do is just we're going to modify this. Instead of using the length of the hidden pixel data, we're going to use the length of our dynamic data offset. Dot dynamic data dot offset x dot length. And what's the difference between this length and this length? Is that this is the number of bytes in the image and this is the number of pixels in the image. One pixel is represented by four bytes in an image which is the RGB and the alpha channel of the image. So this hidden pixel data dot length is actually four times our dynamic offset x dot length. So we're gonna fix that by simply is copying the data one by one. Oops. So plus one, two, plus three. And the same thing here. Plus one, plus two, plus three. But right now, this code is not going to work too because we're counting in pixel variables. We need to count in bytes. So we need to convert this wi into a byte count. Where wi or byte w index is equal to 4 times wi. And we take this and we add it here. And we, this is the difference between the two different conventions. This one is copying every single pixel byte, and this one is copying every single pixel. All right, we remove this now, and we're going to check if it's still working. It's still working. Podboy is still there. Actually, I'm kind of tired of watching this guy. Let's change the image. So we're going to go back to our internet browser, search for data URL. There's a lot. We're going to look for generators. This one looks reasonable. Choose a file. 
we're going to choose our cat image. Generate. Copying the entire thing. And we could just write another variable called cat. Paste it in. What do we call it? Harry Potter G Harry image. I'm just going to call this something similar. G cat image. Save. And then, where we initialize our Harry Potter image, we're just going to replace it with our cat image. Here, cat image. Let's see if it works. There. By default, we have a cat image. All right. Right now, what we want, back to our get viewpoint pixel data, in our for loop, we're copying every single data directly. We want to copy the data with an offset. So how do we do that? We will need to map this G offset length into an X and Y coordinate. If you work with pixel data before, you know that many times we map from a one-dimensional array to a two-dimensional array. It makes it more efficient. So we're going to do that right now. The function to map from two-dimensional to one-dimensional is index equals two y times the width plus x. Width is the width of our canvas. Y is the height in which the pixel is on the, the canvas. And x is the canvas on the y coordinate. We're going to replace this one by one with our element. First, the easiest one would be the canvas width or viewpoint width dot width. The second one would be well we don't really have a replacement for them right now because we need to calculate them. Well basically if you're mapping from Two dimensional to one dimensional, this would be your function. I'm just going to copy this to a side and put it out in a comment. We are going to reverse this function so we can calculate x and y. How do we do that? I'm going to type it here var wx is equal to you can see that this is this is a multiple plus something there. You can write index, and how do you get the remainder of a specific function? We just use the modulus calculation, and it would be modulated by. The viewpoint width. What this does, it will give us a, the remainder of the index divided by the width, which is the remainder here would be our x. And for the y, it's even simpler. We just need the number of times y is divided, divisible by the width. So we take index, divide by 
width. And here, we want to use a floor function. So floor times this number. All right, and that's our mapping function. And we have our x and y. If our x and y, we want to add the offset of our pixel. New x is equal to our old x, which is wx. Plus our offset x. And our new y. Oh, typo, typo. New y is equal to our wy plus our offset y. We want to check if this new x and new y is within the boundaries of our canvas, which is quite easy actually. All we have to do is say if w new x is greater than zero and w new x is less than the width. Which width are we using? We're using the viewpoint width. Dot width for our multi condition if statement, we need to make sure that the brackets are properly placed. If that is the case, then we would continue to the next pixel. We want to add more conditions here. Well, we don't want to overcomplicate things. We're going to just separate it into two lines. We're going to repeat the same thing before the Y. And for the Y, we're going to check the height. With that, if it's bigger than our, if it's outside of our canvas, it's just going to skip to the next pixel in the width direction and the height direction. With this new x and new y, we need to convert it back to our one dimensional pixel array. So we take this equation, new index. And we're just going to replace new y with y, or y with new y, and x with new x. And this new index, it's in the pixel frame, so we need to multiply by 4 for the byte array. Does this make sense? We're going to add some comments. Get pixel. X, Y coordinate. Add pixel offset. Check if pixel is within canvas width. Check if pixel is within missing it in here canvas height. Convert x and y 
back to one dimensional array. One dimensional array index and then convert to byte array then we copy there's actually a logical error here could let's see if you realized so we have the new index but the old index we want it back as from our original pixel data location so we should not have just used byte index here we should have left this as wi for our original byte data and new byte data we're going to make it new index and we're going to take this and replace only in the viewpoint data area. This is looking a little bit messy. I activated word wrap so that everything would be on the page. Usually if it's flowing properly, it would just go on and it'll look cleaner. All right, refresh to make sure everything is all right. Bob, let's see. We have an error. W index is not defined in the pixel XY coordinate. All right, it's here. The reason why is because we copied this function directly. It's, this W index is actually WI. Refresh. And we still have nothing. We are going to debug. Because at this point, it's supposed to be zero zero. Uh, our offset is zero. Next is zero. Looks okay. Okay, let's make this more reasonable. We're just going to skip a few more iterations so that we have an actual number. So viewpoint width is this. WI is 2. Oh. Aha. Uh -huh. Our if statement here is wrong. All right, let's see. These are common sources of error. Here I said new x is greater than zero. What we want is new x is less than zero. Then we continue. And here, if new x is greater than the view width, viewpoint width, then we continue. These are common sources of error for logic errors. If you're not lucky enough to have a debugger, these are the things you should check right away to make sure your conditions are correct. The best way to do this is to read it out. New x less than zero and new x greater than width, then you skip or continue. New y less than zero and new y greater than height, then you continue. Before, it would have read with the original code, which is like this, like this, new x greater than zero and new x less than width, then you continue, which would skip our entire image. So, do we have anything now? let it run. Our cat is back there again. Now with this mapping function for pixels, we could do some calculations for our dynamics. Mm 
this is to draw we're going to open a new well we're not really going to open but we're going to draw a new scope here in this scope we're going to iterate through every single pixel and calculate their new dynamics or a new offset location so we're going to have our trusty for loop equals to zero wi less than d global dot dynamic dot offset y or f offset x dot length plus plus wi here we can decide whatever we want to do to calculate a proper x and y coordinate to make things simple, we're just going to do a slight shift in the x direction. x equals, so plus equals to dot dx dy. And how are we going to do that in our function? We're going to update dx to equal to, let's say, 2. Let's make it 1 because the frame rate is relatively fast. Refresh. Oh, as we're using arrays, we should probably just remember to do this. You have to put the indexes in there. Refresh, and we should see our image slowly moving to the side. This is what we're doing right now. For fun. We're going to add, huh, I was expecting it to go to the side and that's it actually. Ah, that's why. The reason why it keeps on revolving, it's nice, but it's not what we need. It's because it should be four here. Ah. This is so embarrassing. You can't be great, less than zero and greater than a width at the same time, unless your width is zero, right? So, this condition here should be an OR. If we do this, we refresh, our image is supposed to go to the side and go away. Well, we see a little bit here. Which is not supposed to happen. Oh. Equal. Greater or equal. Refresh. And we should not see that pixel here. Good. Now. We're ideally right now we're logic free or logic error free logic errors are the most hard to debug when you're coding syntax you have your computer to help you but the computer is just doing whatever you're telling it logic errors are difficult because it's your thought process that's problematic all right now we're going to add a time factor in here because I like to use time. Go to our dynamic. Oh, go to this location. We're going to add like before a comma here. 
last iteration time. And as before, we're going to initialize it to our current clock in our initialization function right before our game loop. In global dot last iteration time equals to new date bracket dot get time. This is a function. And in our game loop, we're going to add a section called time calculation. New time equals to all this. WDT, the change in time is equal to last iteration time new time minus last iteration time. Remember, this is in milliseconds, so we're going to convert it to seconds by dividing it by 1000. Then, just so that we save on performance, we don't want to call this function twice. I'm just going to type new time here. Now we have a time that we can play with. And as usual, we're going to put this on our integration of our exposition. We're just going to write global dynamic dx times time. This would make our, if we didn't have errors, did I do something wrong here? I forgot to initialize it to zero. This would make our image go to the side at one pixel per iteration. And then I did something wrong again. Once again, we're going to have to put a brick point. This time, because the only thing we modified was time, we're just going to put one here. This undefined. So the iteration was 1.8 seconds. It just love it. It should work. So probably our mapping function here. Right. We could highlight this to see the value. That it just went too fast. One point eight two. Ah, okay. It's just a little bit too fast. All right, let's see this. We're going to change this to. You know what? In our game loop, we should probably add more comments. Here, we're going to write dynamic calculations. Mm -hmm. 
here we're going to write pixel mapping. I think one of the reasons why it didn't work is because this offset location here, we're adding a float to an integer. We should make it an integer. You can type math dot round or you can floor it. Yeah, we'll just floor it. This would truncate all the decimal places afterwards. Let's see if this works. It's working now, and it's moving one pixel at a time to the side. Well, one pixel per second. Go back to our dynamic calculation. We can make it a little bit more interesting. We can make it times let's say math dot sign WDT. We'll need to add a frequency to this. Uh, just put a multiple or something. 0.5. Refresh and see what it looks like. Maybe that was a little bit slow. Oh. Ah, I'm so stupid recently. It's taking the delta time only. What we need is the actual time. So we could just say we could add another variable here. Usually we say it's called elapsed time. Equals to WDT. But we need this to transcend our iteration. So we're just going to do this and type G global and add this elapsed time to our iteration time here. If we do that, every iteration, this elapsed time would add the change in time. And this elapsed time, which we should have added here, would give us a number that would go back and forth. Now it's working properly. And now our cat is swinging back and forth, plus and minus 10 pixels. Now we're going to do something even more interesting. We're going to see if we can make it so we can interact with it. First, we're going to add a mouse event. So back here, we're going to add another argument called mouse handler. We want the X the Y and the the used parameter. Eventually if you want to smooth out the mouse you'll need to have a you'll need to keep track of the previous 
x and y position as well, but for now, we're just going to keep it simple like this. In our init function, we'll add some event listeners. So, where is our image? We, don't, we haven't referenced it yet. All right, let's do that. As usual, I should do it more often. Add comments. Inside canvas. Load image file button. And here we're going to type load image actions or events. Game loop start. Here, before our game loop, we're going to add some mouse events. Mouse events. So what we need to do is we're first going to check when the mouse is hovering around our canvas. So we need to get our canvas. How do we do that? We go down to a code that is getting the canvas, like this one, copy. Scroll back to where our function is, paste it here. No, not equal to canvas, then we do stuff. PF. With this, we're going to add an event listener. WV, WV event listener. It's mouse move, so whenever the mouse moves, or, yeah, mouse move, then we will do something function here's an event object I event open curly brackets and here we will define what our function does we defined a global dot mouse handler dot use equals to true and then we're going to say g global dot mouse handler dot x is equal to i event dot x and the same thing for the y this would give us our mouse x and y position And based on that mouse x and y position, we're going to do something. But first, let's see what does event have. Switch this back over this way. Refresh. There's no errors. We're going to put a breakpoint in our mouse handler. See, we move our mouse, the event becomes true, and these are all the attributes that you have for the mouse handler. X and Y is the location in which the mouse is. There's another called page X and page Y, offset X and offset Y. I really don't know what the difference between them are, but page X is relative to the page top corner of the page and offset X is I would assume the item itself I'm not sure if you know please help me by answering that question for me the documentation is kind of hard to understand
usually I just use X and Y. It's there. Oh, screen X and screen Y is relative to the window screen, I believe, or the viewpoint. All right, let's continue. Once we have that, We could say that if our mouse is used, oh yeah, because we have mouse use, we want to we want our handler to turn off when our mouse is off of the canvas. So we're gonna add another one called mouse. mouse out it detects when the mouse is outside of leaves the canvas and we're going to say use equals to false in our dynamic equation we're going to do this if g global dot mouse handler dot use we're going to do something we're going to make it wobble this we want it to be more obvious so we're going to times the time by 10 this would make it faster refresh It's not moving now, is it? Oh. See, it's wobbling. The reason why it's still moving when I don't have my mouse on is because we changed the velocity and we didn't set it back to zero. We can set dx equals to zero. That'll be more obvious. Maybe we do it this way. If our mouse is there, then we go the other way. Refresh. So right now it's going one direction. Ah, it's so slow. Five pixels per second. It's going one direction. I put my mouse over. It's going the other direction. So what's the point of having it just move back and forth? What we want to do is have it interact with the mouse. So how are we going to do that? We're going to calculate the new position of the X and Y. We're going to calculate the new position of the X and Y coordinate. And calculate it, the effect of the mouse on that new X and Y coordinate. We're going to scroll down to our copy function, load image events. and copy the new x and new y calculation so if you go all the way down here or in our for loop we're just going to copy this lit and move or and paste it in our for loop we're going to have a variable called canvas width equals to g global dot hidden canvas dot width this will replace our width in our 
a virgin. Then as we're using we're using the numbers for calculations, we do not need to have the floor function here. So we're gonna go ahead and remove that. And we're going to go ahead and rename this to current y and current x let's say cur this way our code is in one line with that we're going to calculate the distance of the x and y pixel from our mouse location. I don't think we really need this unless the mouse is active, so I'm going to go ahead and copy this and move it inside our if statement here. All right. Control F to fix our tabs. And we're going to calculate the radius of that pixel to our mouse. The that the x mouse equals to d global or the meter x minus g global dot mouse handler dot x same thing for the y and the radius square is equal to the dx using Pythagorean times wdx plus wdy mouse times wdy mouse this would give us a radius and we want to apply the effect only if it's within a certain radius as this is common I'm just going to type var radius limit equals to limit let's say 200 pixels for now and to be more efficient I'm going to calculate the radius in terms of the square radius. Or let's see. To be more efficient, I'm instead of using the radius, I'm going to use the radius square. SQ is shorthand for square. And this is equal to the radius times itself. All right, we have that. So we're only going to consider the pixel if this rad sq is less than the limit radius limit sq. Oops, the other way. And only if this happens, we're going to calculate the radius of the pixel using the math dot sqrt square root of this radius square or rad square now based on whatever we decide if it's within this radius we could do whatever we decide with relative to the mouse
we're going to apply a gravitational pull on that unit, on that pixel. So we're going to calculate forces. We're going to start by having a variable called WFA, uh, FX equals to, we want to have some kind of normalizing force so that it will pull our pixel back to its location. We're going to use this Hooke's law, which is just calculating a string force. So we usually use negative k times dx. In our case, dx would be the global dynamic offset x. And we're going to define a k. Wk. I had this tested out before. We're just going to set it to 1000 for now. However, in order for it to settle down in its proper location, we need to have some kind of damper. So we're going to add another force called the damping force. X plus equal to, and this is represented by negative C, a constant times the velocity, Vx. For us, the velocity is simply the dynamic ox offset dy, uh, dx. So we're going to replace that with that. Dynamic offset dx, wi. And c is a constant that we defined before I tried this one out. And this seemed to work quite well. We're going to repeat the same calculation for the y coordinate. So just replace y everywhere. And we need to interpret this into our velocity in the end. So we're going to scroll down to the bottom and add it to our integration. How do you convert force into velocity? Easy. You change it to an acceleration and integrate it. So we have variable wax, which is the x coordinate acceleration, acceleration, and it equals to wfx divided by a mass. For now, we're just going to Define W mass as let's say 250. And we're going to calculate the Y acceleration as well, which is WFY divided by mass. Alright, let's build this up a little bit. And we would integrate this into our velocity. How do we do that? Simple. Dynamic dot dx equals to or plus equals to our wax times oops cap locks wax times wdt. Same thing for the y. And for our mouse effect, we're going to add a gravitational pull to it. We're just going to calculate a gain based on the distance of the pixel to our mouse, and then use that gain times a constant. So let's see that. Gain equals equals to w square limit 
radius limit minus w radius. This would give us a number that is going to be maximum at the radius limit and decrease as that radius decreases. We want to normalize this number. So the beginning we want to normalize this number by 0 to 1. So it's going to be the gain divide and equal by w radius limit. This would change our gain from 0 to 1, or 1 to negative infinity, but we only want it from 0 to 1. So we're going to only act, use it if w gain is greater than 0. And when this is from 0 to 1, we're going to add a pole to our forces or pixel. So fx, f, w, fx is equal, plus equal to, we're going to call that constant q times the gain times its component in the x direction, which is wdx mouse. The x mouse over the radius. So basically, this WDX mouse is a unit version of the X component, a normalized version of the X component. And this is the magnitude of the force. I'm going to type that out actually. Var force F mag equals to WQ times a gain. And then fx equals to the force magnitude times the component of that vector, the normalized component of that vector. We're going to do the same thing for the y, which is simply replacing the x with the y. We still need to define WQ. This WQ would be our attraction force. It could be anything you want. If it's positive, then it'll push the pixels away. If it's negative, it's going to pull the pixels towards its towards the mouse. I tested this value before, and it seems to work quite nicely. All right, I can refresh and see what we have. Hopefully, we don't have any errors. Right now, it's moving all the pixels towards the center, but it's not restoring properly because we forgot to remove this global dynamic dx equals to five. We're going to remove that. Refresh. All the pixels are moving towards the center. Something's off. I think we're not clearing the canvas at the moment. We're going to move down to our draw function. Because essentially these pixels here should go away. 
and here is our draw function and we are not clearing the canvas before we draw get the pixel data so let's do that clear canvas clear Clear rack. Clear rack would draw uh, remove. Clear rack would remove a rectangular area on the canvas. Starting from zero zero, and it would be dot viewpoint dot width, and the height of the rectangle would be the viewpoint dot height. Something is still kind of off. As you see, our pixels are restoring to their proper location. I'm just going to use this view for a moment. This pixel here is probably because we round the. It's probably because we floored the value, so it truncates the pixel location. It's here. When we copy the pixels. When we calculate our new x and y, we should use a round function to remove those. So if we play around with it again, remove it, those lines are now gone. You should probably check if it's dividing by zero because the radius here is used as a divider. So probably 
if we check if red square is greater than one. I don't think that's our real issue here. But it doesn't hurt to have to check. Okay, guess that was our issue. It was dividing by zero. Alright. So, remember, check if you're dividing by zero. Now, we want to increase this radius a little bit more to have a more dramatic effect. Fresh. And our original value for Q had an extra zero. Go away, and everything is back to normal. Nice. Let's check how it looks with our pot bore or potter boy. It seems that I forgot to clear the canvas when I draw the hidden image. It would be best to remove it. This way, our Potter Boy would be the sole star of our viewpoint. So, here, drawing image on hidden canvas. These comments are really critical because all these code looks more or less the same. Without these comments, it's easy to get lost. So, it's good to put comments. Remember that. So before we do draw image, we're just going to clear the canvas. So let's do this dot clear can clear rec as before zero zero the width is canvas width the height is canvas height. With your semicolons, refresh. Load Harry Potter. Load, and he's there, and he's alone. Close the debugger. When you close the debugger, you get a little bit more speed in your computation. Let's load our Among Us. Load. Try full screen. That's 12. Oh, that's 11. Oops, too many pixels. What should I do? I'm just going to click Control and scroll to reduce the number of pixels on the screen. Thank you very much for watching. And once again, if you learned anything good from our tutorial, please give me a like. It really helps me with the algorithm and it will share this knowledge with the world. Thank you very much, and see you next time. I'm just going to play a little bit around with it a little bit. If you want to play with it on your own without writing all the code out, check the description for the link. 
I will be posting it on my GitHub repository. and our trusty logo. <laughs> 